pointed out, we have been one of those companies, possibly one of the first companies also in the chemical industry that have understood the impact of industry 4.0 um, for our industry and have um, invested quite uh, heavily in stepping up our game, building the right capabilities and, and implementing technologies that help to accelerate our digital transformation help to um, create new revenue streams and, and leverage efficiency potentials through these technologies. Fantastic. Okay, maybe I also introduce a little bit myself. So the, I am the Chief Digital Officer of Hong Kong Productivity Council. I have been here for a little bit more than two years. And before that, I actually worked for the General Electric GE, one of the most powerful manufacturing house in the world for 22 years. And um, as you, some of you may know, that um, GE has been a very big about the digitalization and also transforming itself into a digital types of company. And I have actually seen how they were doing it. And so maybe some of the lessons learned and also good experience I can also share with the audience today. Excellent. I'm sure we're gonna have a fantastic conversation. To all those who are listening to this live stream today, I'd like to make it uh, as casual as possible and I'd like to make it very, very informative and focused on where your biggest questions and your biggest curiosities lie to take advantage of the opportunities in Industry 4.0, to take advantage of the opportunities in learning and education with HKPC, with Accelerate, and understanding the future of work and understanding how that future can be brighter for you. So please feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat function or in the Q&A and I'll try and answer them along the way. And uh, after about 75 minutes, we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session, which will be monitoring some of the top questions. Um, and please feel free to be as involved as you can. This is a, a great chance for us all to create a better manufacturing industry that serves the world better um, tomorrow. So I'd really love to start from Sebastian. I'd really love to understand, um, you had such a terrific experience and terrific career in this industry. What are you most excited about when you think about industry 4.0 and the path ahead? The one thing that I'm possibly most excited about is, um, is the opportunity to really fundamentally transform how we create value uh, for and with our customers. Um, BASF is a materials maker, right? We make chemicals and we sell chemicals. We have 150 plus years experience in doing so. And what digital technologies and specifically AI, smart manufacturing, you know, digitalization and supply chain eventually offers us is to interact with our customers in a more straightforward, faster um, and, and cohesive way so that we can accelerate actually innovation in our industry, not only in our chemicals industry, but also in our downstreams industries, right? Like it's a, the world around us is moving faster and faster and faster. And the chemical industry being such a critical enabler of value creation for a lot of value, uh, for a lot of industries, it is uh, imperative for us to, to engage in that type of uh, activity, digital transformation, and um, to use the opportunity for value creation together with our customers. This is really what I would say, like, you know, this, this really makes the difference eventually. Fantastic. And how about yourself, Edmund? What are you most excited about? with the future of Industry 4.0? Well, actually for me, for Industry 4.0, I see it as a very nice merge of the IT technology with the traditional manufacturing technology. Because if you think about it, in the past, when the computer first got born in like many years ago, it started to impact a lot of the surface industry and a lot of, of course, our human life being. But when it is talking about like manufacturing, you cannot really do anything without data. But with Industry 4.0, we are talking about how we can real time collect the data, analyzing the data and make use of the data. And when you are looking at how do you real time do all these things, you cannot do it by human being. You have to make use of the machines, you have to make use of the AI. So it's that, that's why I say it's a perfect merge of both technology from the IT side and also from the manufacturing side. And one thing very, excited besides what Sebastian talking about on the whole value chain is also it actually helped to accelerate manufacturing technology as well because if we think about it so now with the use of data you no longer rely on 
some of the know-how or the, or the experience of certain skilled the labor. But it all becomes data. And then you can further analyze it, innovate it, and then to create something new. It also gives opportunities to many so-called high-cost cities like Hong Kong or some of the other places because it's no longer a competition of whether you can do it cheap or not. But we are talking about how do we produce more customized products at a very affordable cost. So these are some of the exciting things that I really appreciate about industry for fun. Fantastic. Um, even for myself, working with a lot of uh, manufacturers over the years and helping them think through their roadmaps, uh, their, their workforce development initiatives, it's, it's very clear that this is not creating abundance just for those manufacturers and their customers. But when doing this, right, right, we get to create more beautiful um, workplace for those that are working in the industry, as well as for society as a whole, sustainable manufacturing creating more environmentally friendly practices and using AI where we can reduce waste and create more abundance. That is very, very exciting for me. So let's try and break this down a little bit. It's obviously a lot of words out there. When we think of Industry 4.0, we think of sensors and robots and predictive manufacturing and AI and deep learning, machine learning, and, and the list just goes on. So um, I'd love to hear from you both. Um, how should we think about breaking these things down, not just you know, at, the, at the manufacturing process level, but Holistically, how do we think about this at a macro level to grasp such a major change that's happening in such a short period of time? Um, it's okay if I start, yeah, right? Okay. Um, so, so when we started um, looking into Industry 4.0, um, that was, I would say, about five years ago, like really seriously. Like, of course, like, you know, we've, we've done IT systems, we have OT systems in place, we have analytics in place, like all of that. But like, you know, really look into this, like what does Industry 4.0, the framework means for us? That was about like five years ago, I would say. And, and what we have, um, you know, we started out with um, putting together like, you know, look at, look at the overall landscape, you know, uh, what does the framework say? Like a couple of buzz, buzzwords and, and, and we started a couple of these, these projects, but very, very quickly we figured out we need to uh, put this into a more holistic framework. Uh, it is simply not enough to do one lighthouse project here and another one here and another one there and then, you know, call yourself a digital company or, or uh, you know, claim that, you know, claim victory, right? Eventually we have to say like, okay, we need to put this into a larger framework. So we started looking into what we call smart manufacturing or smart supply chains, uh, digital business models, smart innovation, digitalization and R&D. Um, also like the underlying IT systems and infrastructure that we need for all of that. Um, data and, and, and AI at some point also came in. So, so we structured this around like a number of larger work streams and we assign people to this. We hire people for this externally and internally that help us to accelerate this. Um, so I can, I can only say like, you know, um, when, when we talk about industry 4.0, like industry always think about like manufacturing or making stuff. No, it is a much bigger process and it touches basically every aspect of the company, including for example, HR topics like how do you hire people, how do you remunerate them, et cetera, et cetera. What about yourself, Edwin? Sure. Um, so what Sebastian described that is a very good framework, and maybe I just kind of twist it a little bit. So when we look at the industry 4.0, we kind of divide it into a few steps from zero I all the way to four I. So um, it's all around what I just described the data. So for example, when we get to the one eye stage, which means that this company already has the capability to collect real-time data. So the real-time data, as the pastor has mentioned, could come from the manufacturing operation. So which means that your machines need to be able to generate the data and then get collected. But also it touches your non-manufacturing process as well, because you need to know what is your ordering situation, what is your supplier data situation, and also even including some HR data, such as how many workers is going to take leave tomorrow, and then how is it going to impact your planning? Holistically. Holistically. So that's the data visibility. And then you get the two eye, then okay, you need to be able to analyze it and start to think about how to make use of them. Because data itself is not very helpful if you are not using it. 
And then afterwards, then even though we are talking about like AI machine learning, but at the end of the day nowadays, you kind of still need to have like human decision merging together with the suggestions recommended by the AR machine learning. So that gets to the first state, the three I state of the fiber um, human interface system. And then of course, it eventually, then it should lead to the four I, which is the kind of like a flexible and um, autonomous production so that the equipment, the parts can talk to themselves and that they can self-arrange. They should be able to read what's the coming in the order and then how to produce it. And that's what we, how we are dividing into four stages. And that's how we are teaching our, our clients to think about from day one, the holistic framework. So as Sebastian mentioned, don't just look at it like by project, by project, by project, and then you don't know what you are getting to. So having that framework, and then you lay down step by step, then you are for sure that knowing you are heading to the right direction. Absolutely. I really like how you both touched on the importance of looking at this mental framework um, holistically, both on the breadth side, across functions, so HR, supply chain, but also on a depth endpoint, right? The data related to manufacturing, the data related to your suppliers. So we have both the, the need to go deep, to move faster, to move forward on both breadth and depth, but that's still a lot of complexities, right? In your experience working with such senior leadership, right? Some of the top manufacturing firms in the world work with HKPC, upskill themselves. How do you think about reducing all that complexity, the breadth and the depth into a roadmap? And I'd love to hear that also right after um, in terms of roadmap planning for BASF. So, you know, from my experience, um, we lay out all the framework and everything. And at the end of the day, the difficulty is that whether it is a big company or a small company or faces, is the buy-in from the employees. And how do you get the buy-in from the employees? At the end of the day, they are only thinking about one question in their mind. Where am I? after all this transformation. If you cannot tell me where I am going to be, I, of course, as an employee, I cannot say no, but I will create thousands and millions of reasons and excuses. Maybe I cannot kill the project, but I will make it move as slow as possible, give you as many headaches as possible. Decelerate. Correct. So that's why when I was driving my business unit, to implement, to go digital, to go to the smart production, blah, blah, blah. The first thing that I actually did is that I tried to map out how we are going to place them, what kind of skill set that they may be missing after the transformation, and then what kind of training, and where am I going to put them? So after they know that they are going to have a place, of course, at the end of the day, I may not be able to accommodate all of them but at least I will have a majority of the workforce working, working at the same direction as I want to go. So this is something that's very important. And then a lot of people may call it like change management, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we have to be careful and be sensitive about that because it's all human beings that making things happen. So that's important. Oh, absolutely. And, and possibly we can touch upon that a little bit later, how we approach this in, in, in BASF. Uh, to come back to your question, like also like, you know, roadmap, right? Um, so, so when I engage with, with my counterparts in the, in, in the business units, right? Like they always ask me, like, show me, show me what you can do. And then my answer is like, you know, we can do a lot, uh, you know, possibly more than you will need and possibly more than, is, you know, is, is, is useful for you. So, so in, when, when we start about roadmap or like, you know, where should you start? Like start with the needs perspective. Like, you know, what is driving your business today? What type of changes do you see in your industry? What type of changes do you see in your supplier side, in your customer side, in your customer's customer side? Like what is happening around you? And, and, and start looking at like, you know, from a, from, a, from a challenge perspective, you know, these are a couple of challenges that I'm facing or possibly will be facing going forward, right? And once you've understood that, um, you, you will be able to formulate some type of digital vision, you know, that's a, it's a bit of an overstretched word, but like some type of vision, some type of target picture that you want to achieve and out of that, you can then derive, okay, like what are the fields where I should be investing, where I should dig deeper into, 
and and you will be able to figure out um, you know what are the most suitable technologies or products or solutions that um, help you to to tackle these challenges right so like I, I you know that's it's a bit of a like a non-traditional approach like instead of like pushing technology it's first like you know understanding what's the need is and then tailor it um, to um, to the need situation but I, I found this more successful fantastic so you mentioned Edmund the need to have this sort of um, analysis of future state versus present state and you mentioned it in the context of BASF I'm really curious for you both from an industry standpoint and also a company specific standpoint where and how does one begin right is that something that a, a leader kind of says um a cio or cdo says this is what you know we're going to do an analysis day um should it come from the people that's working in those individual divisions should it come from together uh, should it be a process should it be a culture like how do we think about the sort of light bulb moment to get this thing started for those that are just getting started uh oh wow um <laughs> Um, when we started, as I've said, like about five years ago, um, it was actually the question of our CEO, this, the CEO um, gentleman, uh, Kurt Bock um, is his name. Um, he eventually asked like his, his, his top leadership, like what, you know, I, I keep on hearing industry 4.0, industry 4.0, digital, like I see like all of these companies popping up. I have no clue what that means. Tell me. It's like you know, set up a team that that eventually is able to to formulate uh, a vision. What is Industry 4.04 for BASF? And we aptly named this project um, BASF 4.0. So, um, like it was a, it was a top down initiative. Um, and and as I've said, then you know we, we tried out a couple of things and we set up these work streams and then we eventually moved forward. Um, however, it is not only a top down thing. Um, and, and this is to be, it's important to keep in mind. Um, there are certain types of uh, elements of digital transformation, even like data analytics or, or um, AI type of tasks, where you can really with like, you know, technology that is basically on your fingertips, right? Like you can go to Azure, you can go to AWS, you can go to Google or whatever, uh, Alibaba, Baidu, whatever cloud provider is out there. And, and basically have a look at their technology and, and try to like bring it in with, with your, with your uh, work reality. So you don't have to wait for like, you know, inspiration coming from the top, right? You can start at your working level as well, right? Um, that needs a little bit of like, you know, personal education and a drive to acquire a new skill. Um, but you can certainly do this. Like I'm, um, you know, the, what we're doing now on like in terms of e-commerce in China and globally, oftentimes it's an initiative like rather from the working level, right? The group, group leader level, instead of like, you know, the CEO saying like, oh, you have to do this, right? So um, a, a top-down type of push, you know, gives it the visibility and, and the importance in order to, to drive like change on a, on a corporate level. But as I've said, on a, on a working level, you can also do it, um, uh, also can do it uh, bottom up. At some point, you will figure out that you can do a lot with, you know, stuff that you have in your fingertips. Um, at some point, um, the element of cost comes into play. So if you want to do large scale transformation that oftentimes involve large scale investments and, and these type of investments typically need to improve by, by the higher echelons of the company. Mm -hmm. Look at yourself, Edmund. I mean, you were mentioning how it's so important to ingrain that in the culture in the right way. Um, how do you see that responsibility hat being uh, done well, you know, when, when leadership works with uh, individual contributors to really move that change forward? Sure. Maybe I answer it in a slightly different angle. Because when I thought about how HKPC roll out and drive the initiative of Industry 4.0 in Hong Kong, what we had done is that we are doing it at a multi-layer level because we understand that these kind of important initiatives, if you do not have the CXO level kind of talking about it, it's very difficult. You cannot just rely on the working team. But if the employee knows nothing about it, then when the CXO asks the questions, it may just go nowhere. 
And that's why when we were rolling that out, we actually target all the groups. So we have to have the session target for the executive level to educate them the concept. Basically, is to inspire them to start to ask the questions. And then at the same time, we do a lot of the public awareness. We understand that they may not be able to know that much, but at least they are aware of it. So when they got the questions from the executive level, they know, oh, maybe I can go to HKPC and first to learn about it, or at least they know what to search from the social media or things like that. So that's how we did that. And that's why even nowadays, when we are thinking about how do we engage a client, uh, we have to do both level as well. So that's important. Fantastic. So let's imagine there's um, someone from our audience who says, great, I'm going to go learn all these things. My people are going to learn this and we're going to chart the direction towards sensors, robots, and strategic uh, initiative of cost saving and revenue generation. Okay, so these are some of the things that they come up. What next? Like we've, we've decided the plan, we have the right people. People definitely want to do this, especially in the era of COVID and, and digital transformation being such a daily, daily need. What next? Um, I mean, like, what, what, what I have found is an incredibly powerful approach and possibly even the fastest approach to, to success or early failure is just trying it out, right? Um, I mean, you know, when, when, when I think about, you know, where I come from and, and you know, the, the type of industry that, that, you know, my company is in and so on and so forth, this is not, it's not a company that has taken on a lot of risk, right? And, and making like, moves into into the future right it's very traditional um, um, you know risk cautious um, company but eventually we have figured out that if we try these 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 little like you know proof of concept called a proof of concept proof of value type of approaches right where, where where you say like okay now we identified our our way forward it's like just try to find the cheapest possible like solution that is somewhat close to what you want to achieve try to take it, try to customize it, and, and um, put it in front of whoever target audience you have in mind, a customer, a supplier, an internal, uh, an internal partner, right? Um, and, and, and just try it out and just collect their feedback and see like, you know, instead of asking yourself like, you know, internally all these questions, will this create value, will this create value? You ask them, your partner, is that valuable for you? Like, you know, would you like to, do you see like, you know, this is making your life easier, better, faster, like whatever it is um, that you want to optimize. So that innovation project approach of, you know, fail fast, fail early, prototyping, um, uh, getting early uh, customer feedback or user feedback, uh, putting it out, um, continuously improving, building MVPs, and then eventually, you know, um, uh, a building, building your solution is what I have found um, the most promising path to success. I, I don't think in this day and age we, we can really afford to, to invest like, you know, one or two or three years into building like the gold plated, you know, solution that solves each and every of your project problems, at least you assume that and only then collect, um, you know, feedback and start putting it out. Like, you know, a lot of companies actually um, uh, became very, very successful, and I don't have to name them, like, you know, global companies, American companies, Chinese companies, thrive on that model of frequent and, and fast-paced innovation. Look at yourself, Edmund. So, you know, from my experience and also what I have observed for those companies that have been doing well, they typically will have the approach that they are encouraging all their employees to do something. So that kind of becomes the, their culture. Because if you think about it, who is the person that knows best about a certain process? Of course, it's the process owner. So you can ask someone to tell the process owner how he or she should improve the process or digitize it or whatever. But actually, wouldn't that process owner be the best person if he or she can think about how to make use of the right technology to do that? So that thing applies to even product innovation, 
developing the next manufacturing process, or how do you deal with customer? How do you serve a customer during the COVID-19 situation, for example? So every one of them is thinking about just one thing to improve. You suddenly find that your company will have maybe hundreds of things that try to improve. So what's important is, of course, the company need to have the centralized resource team to help to facilitate that to happen. For example, telling them what may be the latest technology that they can be thinking of and help them to implement it, especially on how do you manage when you are changing a process. So these are the things that I have seen if a company put in place and really motivate the employee well to do that, then that usually will have a higher success rate. Mm. I, can, I can only full-heartedly su uh, support this. Um, as I've said, like, but like at some point, you also have to equip people with the right tools in order to make this happen, right? Um, uh, the, the initiative can, can come from people, but like, you know, you said, like, what next? So you have to give them some, some type of tool on their hand how to implement their ideas. Like in BASF, we call it citizen development or a citizen developer. It's like, you know, other companies call it differently. What it boils down to is we are working with, a, um, of course, like many other companies with a large office software company. I cannot say the name here, uh, based in Seattle. Um, and um, so, um, uh, so, so like we, we, we have this, so, so we have their, their, their development environment, basically, not like, you know, the high tech development, you know, but, but like, you know, the citizen development. You know, the, the no-code, low-code low code type of environments. Uh, they're, they're analytics software, right? It's like, you know, we pay for these licenses um, quite dearly, and, and um, we can put them to, to good use by encouraging people to acquire these skills and to use these tools then uh, in, in, you know, for their specific purposes, right? And we, we run hackathons and ideathons to, to collect these ideas and make people aware that we have these tools at hand. You know, it doesn't take a lot of time to, to get acquainted and proficient with them, and then you can start using them. Fantastic. So I really like this idea of creating ownership at the sort of mid to junior level, and I really like this idea of facilitation and inspiration and that centralized resource group to make it all happen. And together they, they converge. Let's spend a bit of time going to the specific technology itself. Um, I'm curious to hear um, to the extent that, that you've seen best practices with companies uh, HKPC has trained and advised, which I'm sure are many uh, across a variety of different uh, upstream and downstream. And of course, anything that you're willing to share um, about the specific technologies that you see working from a POC standpoint that you see Kind of taking them to the next stage, um, particularly in the context of a 2020 post-COVID um, world. Basically, what's what's working in terms of a technology standpoint? What do you guys see that is actually really working? Um, what is what is clearly working for for us is, um, you know, when we. It's such a it's such a broad it's such a broad range, right? Like, are we talking about supply chain here? Are we talking about manufacturing? From a technology standpoint, from, from, from a technology from, from a from a technology type of, it's like um, a couple of you know what you what you basically need is um, you know some type of as I've said no code low code environment, right? Just to try something out, you need something uh, where like a tool and and there's a couple of them out there. Uh, where you can ingest large data sets, right? Like I'm not talking about Excel here, right? Like because of its limitations, but like really large data sets and, and clean them up and, and start identifying patterns, right? There's a couple of tools out there for that. Um, I would say like from a technology, like, you know, and, and then going forward, like if you want to create like one of these prototypes, right? You need some type of prototyping software, right? Um, so these are, I would say, like, you know, a couple of the basics that, that you would need, right? Like, and then depending on where you want to go, eventually you need to then branch out, right, into um, specific fields of um, pattern recognition, um, NLP, natural language processing, uh, image processing, image recognition, uh, simulation, you know, on the, on the AI side, or you go um, um, into a more of a commerce perspective, right? There's also like, you know, global providers around this where you can use their platforms to build like 
um, you know, a web shop, right? Or connect um, your your ERP system to um, to a given marketplace or something like this. So it you know it depends a little bit on the on on the field, right? But like I you know I would say like um, if you're looking for something, right? Like, you know, just try to find something like you know the next the next best available thing. It's like don't don't spend too much time on looking for the best technology because eventually stuff is evolving so fast, right? Like, you know, try something out, see it's creating value. If it doesn't work for you, try something different. Are you seeing any technologies seem to work really well? You know, robots or sensors or on the uh, one eye, two eye, three eye, four eye mm -hmm. analytics standpoint? Sure, so, you know, um, just a few things that, few technology that I would like to mention a little bit and it's nothing new uh, to anyone. So it's the artificial intelligence, the robotics, the big data, and also is the internet of things. Why I say all these four things is that um, if you think about it, nowadays when we are having a problem or when we try to improve something, we should think about, oh, is there some kind of artificial intelligence that can help us, whether it is in the form of the computer visions or in the form of um, you know, um, um, making decisions on certain things based on big data, etc. So this is important. And then, so don't think about, ever think about how do we do it manually. Always think about how do we do it using a robot. And robots is not necessary in the form of like a human beings. The robots can be any forms and shapes and you know, size, whatever, that help to serve a certain stuff. And then why IoT is, is important is because they need to communicate. Anything that cannot communicate is not too helpful. Uh, if they cannot get online, their power is a lot limited. So that's why you have to think about how do you connect all these together. And then at the end of the day, it's all about how do you generate data or make use of data. So that's why these four things, I would say that whenever you come across any problems or think about a process, whatever, think about it from that angle first at the minimum. And then from there, then maybe you can branch out to other um, even more advanced technology. But those are four things that I would say um, is important for everyone. And one important thing is many people will say, oh, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a computer scientist. What should I do with it? But if you think about it, your kids start to learn programming. If your kids can do that, how difficult can that be? Right? When the kids has not even completed a graduate or not even going to a secondary school. So at the end of the day, actually think about you as a kid. How do you learn these things? And of course, not everybody needs to be a programmer, but if you have the basics, then you know how to apply and make use of the technology that already make a huge difference. Well, this is fascinating because I think we're approaching the second half of uh, our focus of our conversation which is, you know, it's a very exciting future out there. And now is definitely the time for all those listening to move to Industry 4.0. Now is definitely the time to look into investing in POCs, building a culture of accountability, building a culture of bold leadership that takes advantage of the opportunities of abundance and value creation with IoT, artificial intelligence, and computer vision sort of technologies. And I'm really glad we spent so much time talking about the positives, but we all know this isn't easy. Right, and we all know there's massive disruption to the future of work, and and um, certain people will have very different jobs than what they have today. So let's talk about the education and the upskilling elements um, that is needed. Right, the cognitive uh, feedback loops per se, the brain power per se that goes alongside the organizational impetus. Right, and I'd really love to hear more from you, um, Edmund. What's with the inertia, like? Once we have uh, identified, or a manufacturer has identified that we have to go here, um, L and D training, upskilling, this thing is is such a afterthought, you know, which which is the reality. So I'm really curious if if everyone talks about how important it is to go learn these things, try these things in a no code environment, or just get started. But when it comes to getting started, there's a million reasons why we shouldn't get started. I mean, what are your thoughts on on some of the inertia? on the upskilling to move from business as usual. Sure, so, um, you know, it's talking about a lot of the, when we do a lot of the consultancy works, uh, get in touch with a lot of companies, 
they always talk about one feedback we got is the lack of talents. They cannot find the people with the right skill set, the right talent uh, to help them to do the transformations. And then, of course, you can try to keep on searching until you find someone that you need, but it's usually time consuming and expensive. And that's why, if you think about how the Hong Kong government has been pushing and helping, is offering the subsidies in terms of training. So to help these people on the job to get the new skill set, um, so that they can help to the company to transform. And then at the same time, even think about it to prepare for the next generation because that's the future. And that's why STEM education has been so important that why we want to put more of these kind of net advanced technology into the STEM, into very young kids so, so they start to get used to it. So that perhaps maybe 10 years later, coding becomes a skill set that everybody will know. Not sure whether you remember, perhaps you're still young, not old enough to know that there is a job called typist. Have you heard about that? Typist, people will type. And I'd have been before I was born. Oh, uh, <laughs> exactly. So I'm much older than you anyway. So, you know, there's no such job nowadays because everybody knows how to type, whether you type it correctly or not, well, whether you type fast or not, doesn't matter. But everybody knows how to type. So that's why in the future, perhaps everybody will need will know how to code. And coding is the programmer is no longer a job category, perhaps. So that's why that's why it's important that we put training, the right training for the young kids, but at the same time, we provide subsidies and incentive for the companies to also transform their workforce. Um, but of course, I would say that maybe some of the companies, especially small and medium enterprises, they have been too busy trying to survive, get order, that they may not be aware of some of the, these kind of subsidies that the government is offering. So that's why I always tell the company, when you are thinking about um, how to get resources, don't just look at internally. Think about and also look for free resources. I mean, for example, today's webinar is one of the free resources that may be helped to inspire some of the, whether executive, executive level people or the mid-level people, so you start to think about how should this be applied in your company. Fantastic. I'm curious, Sebastian, um, have you seen some inertia when it comes to actually taking some of these changes and making a reality? Um, it depends, you know, it depends on a number of factors. Um, um, demographics plays a role here, um, how, how long you've been in the company, how, how much attuned you are in, to change in general. Uh, th th there's, a number of, there's a number of factors. But more often than not, I see a lot of excitement around this. And, and people really want to do this. Like when we do like these idea thons and asking people like, you know, come up with something, it's like, you know, we're like, we're drowning in, 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 in ideas, right? Like, and then um, at some point, if you, if you then can, you know, every time you, somebody brings something up, right? You can tell them, so just don't, you know, name the problem, like be part of the solution, right? And then, you know, you can create a, know, call this a project-based learning environment, right? Where you're just not, you know, outsourcing the problem or the solution to somebody else. Like here, it's like, you know, I, you know, here's my problem, solve it for me. And then, you know, I'll, I'll take over whatever comes back. But like, you know, do this in a, in a tandem, right? Like do this together. Um, that, that creates uh, learning opportunities for both sides for like, you know, on the one hand side for the IT folks to learn about like, you know, what's the problem domain and from, from those people that, that are in that specific area to learn about like, you know, technologies and then they eventually, you know, at some point converge and, and I see this is, um, this is actually what's going to happen. This convergence of, of, um, of IT and uh, business or digital and business, like I'm, I'm just thinking about like right now um, of, of a guy like, you know, young gentleman um, in one of the countries here in, in Asia Pacific, super excited about um, e all things e-commerce, right? Like if he, if he started doing something, right? And then at some point, you know, management picks up and starts to encourage him, right? And, and like he's, you know, by training, like his actual job is product manager, right? Like he's, he's actually selling chemicals, right? Or, or like 
you know, managing chemicals. But at some point he got so excited about this, this is consuming most of like, you know, just all things digital, it's consuming most of his working time. And, and, you know, over the, over the two years that I'm working with him right now is like, he, he grew tremendously also in terms of know-how, capability to explain, capability to onboard, work with external partners, et cetera, et cetera. So that type of, you know, project-based learning um, is for me one of the core things or core methods to overcome that type of inertia, right? Fantastic. So on that topic, it's very great to see that there was such a young professional who, who moved so fast um, and that leadership was able to recognize that and nurture that sort of talent, right? These are the leaders of the future that will carry your digital strategies and your smart manufacturing forward. I'm really curious to hear from you both. How can we make that not an exception, but maybe, maybe it's hard to make that norm. Not everyone is built like that, but how do we... You know, how do we make that more commonplace, not just one gentleman in one office, but we really do want to increase more digital cultural champions, per se. And the main force that they are competing against, and I've seen this with all the partners that HKPC works with, all the companies and governments that we educate, I'm sure you've seen this as well at BESF. How do we fight? that force of, I'm too busy, business as usual, got to get that last order in, you know, quarter's ending. I, I can go on and on about that. How do we fight that one force there with that sort of force for creative uh, abundance, per se? Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly easy to say no to any type of innovation, especially in the traditional industry. As a uh, a colleague of mine once once called this uh, this type of culture. There is no punishment for no cooperation, right? Um, so what does that mean, right? Like you know, people. It's very easy to say no because like you know, I'm I'm busy with what I'm doing right now, and like you know, you can't even say anything because like you know, this is what their job description is all about, and and this is what they've been doing. This is what their been their target agreements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I what I um, you know would would see is um, you know as a couple of uh, a couple of methods how to how to make this more common is one is called you know championing. Right, like you know, really visibly recognize individuals' contribution to the digital transformation. Right, like you know, really say like, okay, this um, person, this colleague has done this and that. Right, and and try to publicize this in one form or the other. Right, so so it creates you know recognition and and and, and visibility for for that people. And other people say like, oh, this is something interesting. Right. Um, um, talk about it, right? Like this is one of my, a large part of, of like my job description is, um, you know, create excitement around digitalization. Like, look, you know, we are doing this and that in, in, in Europe, we are doing this and that in North America. Couldn't that be something for you here, right? It's like, and then people say like, oh, interesting. I never thought about this. So let's dig a little bit deeper, right? Engage, talk, champion, right? Like, and, and keep, and keep it, um, on the agenda of everybody involved, right? Like use your internal uh, media, right? Your newsletter that you send to your to your employees, to your colleagues, um, you know, any type of you know town hall. Um, this should be a core element of like that. You don't have to talk about it like for half an hour every time you know you speak to to the colleagues, but like you know mention it and keep it on the agenda of people. That that will help to to transform. Um, you know, a company, one colleague, one business line at a time. Percent at a time, right? Make it ingrained culture. Yeah. I really like the thing you said about recognizing, you know, it's a human instinctive need of our species almost to, to want to be recognized by our peers and we should use those things to encourage those cognitive connections, um, especially when you know, you unlock a new value creator. And if we at the same time then combine it with what also what, what Edmund says, like, you know, um, education, training, real, like, you know, learning opportunities, right? Sometimes people are also afraid of like diving into that type of topic because they simply don't know, right? So you have to at some point, you know, provide sort of like industry 4.0 101, right? It's like, what are the basics? Like, what is the framework? What, what are all these deep learning, ML, AI, uh, sensors, IoT, like, you know, big data, analytics, process mining, data mining, you know, image recognition, like all of like, wow. It's like, you know, if, if you are, wow, indeed. Yeah, it's like, if, if you are 
in a traditional, like, you know, if you're in a traditional industry, it's like, you know, it's so easy to be overwhelmed by this, right? So you have to, I think it's important to, to create, you know, that type of learning opportunities also for, for people and, you know, free webinars are one of the things, you know, the wonderful stuff that you're doing around like offering trainings here to companies, right? Like and, and, and encouraging this and also investing into your people to, to, to take these learning opportunities. Yeah. Absolutely. What about yourself, Edmund? So with all the great ideas and practices that Sebastian has talked about, I just want to add one thing. One thing is that if you want to make it serious, put it in the performance measurements and also make it as one of the criteria for promotion. So if that's the case, then at the end of the day, your employees will care the most how you are measuring them and what achievement he or she need to demonstrate such that he can move on his or her career. So that's why I always told, you know, at some point in time, put it to become part of the performance appraisal. Put it to become a criteria for promotion. It will make a tremendous difference. Well, I have a qu tricky question for you both on, on precisely that. Um, this is a very tough one. But when you're thinking about incentives, it's very important to prioritize the business metrics, revenue, shipment, unit quantity, you know, if you're on the production lines, the uh, costs or the errors per thousandth of units shipped, what have you. You mentioned the need to incentivize it so it becomes serious and formalized. You mentioned the need to formalize and be serious about educational programs, right, which I think is really the differentiator. Learning is the competitive advantage. Um, and too many companies put it on the back burner and the next thing you know, they're obsolete and behind. So learning, I believe, the learning organization that makes it a discipline with incentives and recognition um, is going to win. I really believe that. It does not matter in industry 4.0 or in retail 4.0, in um, banking 4.0, what have you. I think it's across the board. I think it applies to governments as well. You know, Even as a, as a government, you have to have a learning organization as an individual. You know, learning is the core driver. So my question to, to you both, if you start to put it as part of the business metrics and said individual is working towards newer, smarter ways that are a little bit subjective, uh, experimentation, finding new business models, then in some ways the business results go down a bit, right? And then in many companies, when they're going through a digital transformation, the leadership says, how do we cannibalize ourselves, right? There's um, a, a, you know, a story of some media companies like Disney, for example, um, where leadership said, well, we're gonna go subscription and low cost um, as an example. And that's gonna cut into just temporarily um, some of the day-to-day the -day profits, the traditional businesses. So then you're hit with less attention on that revenue. You're hit with also the fact that doing that immediately is not gonna create, as you said, as you both said, results. So this is a very tricky one, the incentives, the recognition, and the need to stay alive, but also cannibalize yourself. How, how should we think about that? that and, and maybe this is, a, this is a lesson or like a you know, best practice. I think it's, at least it's a good practice, what we've done at, at BASF. So, so if you're not quite sure about like where to start and, and what to do about it, right? It's like, you know, think about like, you know, from this ambidextrous, you know, approach, right? Like, you know, one part of, and this is the larger part, like 99.8 or 9% of your organization continue with what they're doing today. Making products, selling products, marketing products, making sure that, you know, uh, shelves are filled, et cetera, et cetera. But take out, you know, a certain number of people from their regular operations, not ivory, and don't put them in an ivory tower, but like, you know, but like remove them one step, you know, from, from, from daily operation and give them a little bit of freedom to experiment and, and, and to showcase and to build success and to be visible, right? Um, so, so for me, this is... Like, you know, so you can protect whatever you're doing, like on, on the one hand side, like oh, your, your core business and, and you're, you're creating a safe environment yeah, where you can do experimentation, where you can really try things out, where you can, you know, go to conferences, meet people, be inspired, you know, 
do a POC, you know, uh, try e-commerce, right? Like, you know, like all of these, all of these things, but like in a sort of a, of a protected environment. And, and over time, you will see like, you know, this is growing from 0.01% of, you know, your employees to maybe like, you know, 0.5 and then maybe one, right? And then at some point, you know, it will, it, there's no longer a need to keep it separate, but then you start reintegrating it into your main line of business, right? So you, you know, for, for companies that, that are not quite sure how to approach this, like, I think this is, could be a very good thing. Like, keep it separate, build some early success, you know, you know, build a strong core and then disseminate and make this, you know, reintegrate this into your main lines of businesses. Um, at least that's what we have done in, in, in the end, so. Edmund, what are your thoughts on that sort of uh, need for incentivizing change, but also business result? Sure. So that is actually a approach that pretty much similar to what uh, Sebastian has mentioned about. So it's a little bit like a startup approach. So because my experience is that for a business unit that has been doing good in one thing, you ask them to branch out a little bit. What turns out to be is that they find out that, you know, I spent so much effort, but the result is so little. And then they start to get the interest. And then they start to lose focus. So that small thing eventually dies. So that approach, I can tell you, I have seen it 99.999% don't work. So that's why it has to be kind of like separated out. Their only job is to work out the new things and make it survive. So it's kind of like a contracting. So you have to give them certain investment and then you expect them that they will not make any profit in the first whatever number of months or year, hopefully not too long. But you have to kind of like, a little bit like the venture capital approach. So you give them some seed money, you let them come back with some proposal experiment and then you, you let them run. Don't get burdened by the typical conglomerate processes and stuff like that. And then you review the result. And then you decide whether you continue, you let them like pitch to you whether you continue to give them the second round, the third round of money or what. And then at the same time, actually, I mean, of course, depends on the resources that you have. You may also create a little bit of the competition as well. So that you kind of maybe have like two groups or three groups, but don't make it too many groups, otherwise you cannot manage. And then let them maybe own a certain segment of the market and let them, let them come back with, to you. So you kind of plant a few seeds and then one may die, one may just social become mediocre and one may become a superstar. And then on that case, you let them grow. I mean, you, you have to be careful whether you integrate them back to the main business. Because once you integrate them back, that is a risk that they will get, um, commoditized that they may be impacted by the traditional way because you know for any big corporations we also have a lot of the corporate processes or you deviate from the corporate processes how can it be i have to send my internal auditing to audit you but for new business model that's how they are going to be successful don't measure them using the typical corporate processes and, and procedure and policy so that will be one thing that um uh, company may, may think about uh, um, as an as an individual approach. So you protect them and see whether they can grow or not. How important then, when you think about organization wide upskilling? I know HKPC they do a lot of this. You're upskilling junior, manager, mid level, senior, C suite, so that they all at their respective levels have new cognitive capabilities to think about smart working and manufacturing. So how do you see the importance of upskilling all those units, right, investing in their education versus the importance of taking out certain individuals and really investing in them, right? If, if one had to pick, obviously one should do both, but if one had to pick the need to invest like a VC new business models, train them and upskill them, one had to invest in the organizational upskilling, um, and I get it, there's no right or wrong answer, but I'm curious to hear how you um, at HKPC kind of see those trade-offs. Um, because as you think about roadmaps, you can't do everything every day. So, you know, the, um, my advice always to our clients and to company is that um, I've worked in company, I mean, commercial sector before. 
And I would say that sometimes the commercial sector has been like too focused on what resources I have. And so I have this much resource, I have to trade off, so I only do A, not do B, do B, not do A. But a lot of the time, we forgot to look outside, to look for free resources, to look for subsidized resources, so that we can do more than just A or B. So until now, unfortunately, a little bit, I would say still a lot of the companies in Hong Kong do not know that. That is, for example, the RTTP funding, that company can actually come to those uh, approved service provider to even help them to design courses for them, particularly, and then get about 75% subsidized or something like that from the government. So if you, if you are not aware, if you never really pay attention to think about how do you get free resources around you to help you to do more, then of course you only, all you can do is to sacrifice, is to choose, but think, think about it from a different point of view. And also, you know, when you do not have resources to send people to paid training classes, how about those free stuff, whether it is a free seminar, a free training, may not get to the very deep level, but at least get them aware of. So all you are losing is maybe a little bit of their work time, but if it is in a webinar, it's perhaps they can even multitask a little bit. So even if they only get 50% of it, they still get 50% of it, okay? Yeah, of course, and yeah. multitask. So <laughs> that's why it's important to always yeah. think out of the box and think about what are the resources you can get outside of your own organization. Don't just look at your own organization. I think it's fascinating because um, I was asking you A or B and you said both, um, which I really like because um, this is a very fascinating new development and I understand that HKPC has been very involved with the uh, Innovation Technology Bureau and I really respect um, how the Hong Kong government is, is really incentivizing 70% uh, reimbursement, 70% around that, yeah, but not exactly. Yeah, but that really creates a brand new set of opportunities. If someone is going to spend some money on upskilling and reskilling, and obviously in the era of COVID, these LND budgets they come under a little bit of challenge and, and question and fire, um, and, and people's strategy in general is going through a lot of tumultuous uh, change. Um, that's an incredible move. Could you tell us a little bit more um, about the Hong Kong centric schemes like RTCP? Oh, sure. Um, actually, you know, we can talk about it for hours, but it's, it's really a program that's talking about how um, we want the company to continue to invest in their employees. And so it's more concentrated around on the skill side. So they're really the new skill um, that can help them. And then the idea is that um, um, the approved service provider will have courses around all these kind of new technology things. And then so of course the company can look at what is available and then just sign up to those classes that they think can benefit their employees. Or if the company has a certain size and, and then they think they can afford a little bit more money, then they can, as I mentioned, go to, to tailor make it. And so that's one uh, side of it, I mean one scheme. And then just recently, um, I believe it is still not available publicly yet, but there is also another scheme coming so that will also be kind of subsidizing uh, trainings to companies, uh, to Hong Kong companies employees. So that's the reasons why I always say it is important to, to pay attention to what is available around you. Don't just look at it internally. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, when we are thinking about training, of course, currently we cannot travel, so unfortunately, but for example, the RTTP training is not just talking about classroom training. It can also be covering like study mission. Because sometimes very importantly is maybe when you go and really see how people do these kind of things, it can better inspire you than you just sitting in a classroom listening to the instructor. Maybe the instructor is very fun like you, so, but it could be as boring as me that people fall asleep <laughs> anyway. So that's why the study mission is important. And that we see that when they come back, they will have new idea generated from the trips and then you know, they can implement it internally or come to HKPC to seek for help whatsoever. Um, and so that's also the other elements that can also benefit the cooperation as well. Fantastic. So as we're approaching my final question to you both, this has been an incredible conversation. I'm so, so inspired by the future. Um, I'd just like to like um, ask all of the audience who's listening in, 
Right now is a great time. Please put in some Q&A. We're going to get to you in just a second. Feel free to do it on the chat or on the Q&A, and we'll um, start answering some questions from the audience in just a couple of minutes. So as we approach the end of the discussion session, I want to wrap up with one final question for you both. How should smart manufacturing and businesses and education providers think about all these technologies beyond the context of the commercial aspects of doing business, right? Um, a lot of people, millions of people really are gonna get uh, disrupted. You know, uh, millions of people are gonna have no jobs and millions of people are gonna have new jobs. Um, certain companies will not learn and keep up and they will go obsolete and certain companies will capture far more uh, market share. So our world is changing in an in incredibly amazing but also slightly frightening way. Um, so I guess my question to you both is, is, what does this all mean when you think about business and its role to society? I mean, what do we have as institutions, as a responsibility to do when it comes to major disruptions to supply chain or major disruptions to, to people's lives? You know, livelihoods are going to be impacted by this. And this isn't 2050 or, or you know, 70 years from now. This is happening in this moment. This is the next five to 10 years. Now with COVID, maybe the next three years. So how should we think about those relationships and, and sort of moral and obligation, you know, moral responsibilities and obligations to do good sort of business in the future in relation to society? And I'd like to invite both of you to, to answer. So maybe I can answer first. So, you know, um, the reality is we cannot prevent change to happen. So a lot of people try, so it, they will fail. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, for example, for organizations like HKPC, that's why we want to be able to help the general public to be best equipped, best prepared for the change. That's why we say, you know, the keep upskilling, looking around what's available, keep learning is important. So we, are, we have a mission to, is to help the general public to help the Hong Kong companies to transform. That's why we're providing all the system. And now I would say at a company level, I'll go back to what I've just mentioned at the beginning. When you are thinking about a certain driving, a certain change, a digitization or whatever, have the empathy. Think about how you are going to deal with your people and what you can do to help them to survive and also get transformed. So it's not just about your company process is transformed, but also about your employees get transformed. And of course, for commercial sector, at the end of the day, the goal is to maximize the profit. I understand that. But that may not necessarily mean it's a conflicting goal of helping as many of your employees to transform as well. So have that empathy upfront, think about them, help them, you will get a much better result. And how about yourself, Sebastian? Yeah. Um, at BASF is a, is a company deeply rooted in, in natural sciences and in engineering and, and technology in, in, in general, right? So, so there is, I believe, uh, not I believe, there is a strong culture around um, learning, acquiring new skills, and, and, and continuous self-development. Right? Like, you know, you simply have to keep up, right, with the, with the, with the changing times. And um, so we have continually, continuously invested in, in, in L&D. Right now, as you've mentioned, it's a little bit difficult, but thanks again, Edmund, for, for highlighting, you know, there is, you know, external resources available for this. Um, going, going forward, it's like we, we have to be mindful that in a lot of countries, maybe not so much in Asia Pacific, but more so like in Western Europe um, and in other parts of the Western world, we have a, a demographic development place that, that will eventually to, to larger and larger groups of, of, of society retiring, right? And, and a lot of, you know, um, um, experts are no longer available to the job market, right? So we certainly believe that 
uh, digitalization, digital transformation, specifically in the realm of you know um, artificial intelligence, will actually help to bridge a skill gap, right? Like you know we have to build these systems with these experts today, because like we can already see like on the horizon eventually they will leave the workforce because they will simply retire, and if they retire they take all their knowledge with them. Right. So if, if it's possible, like think about like digital transformation as also a, a tool of preserving knowledge and expertise and domain know how and, and customer contacts that you have and relationships that you have and, and sort of con, con, convert this into into a type of technology base that you can carry into the future. So I'm not like I'm, I'm yes, I'm, I'm buying into the argument that there will be a lot of change to the workforce and, and people uh, will have to uh, learn new skills. Yeah, um, I think it's very, very important for us as a company to understand, like to also figure out like, you know, where is this going to happen? We do that actively. Uh, where is this going to happen? How are people impacted and what can we do to keep these people? Because like, you know, they're working for us like for 10, 15, 20, 30 years sometimes you would be surprised uh, about work careers and BSF, how long they could be. It's like, you know, these people know stuff. They're valuable for us, right? They're valuable for our customers as well. How can we keep them? How can we reskill them? And, and con continuous like learning and, you know, providing these, these opportunities is certainly a key to this. Um, we should eventually do more in terms of education around like digital tools and uh, data analytics and, and, and AI. I think we can, like, to be quite frank, like, you know, I'm not telling the secret here, I think we can step up our game here. I think that's the case with a lot of the, the firms that are listening in today. Um, really quick one, right, as I get the uh, Q&A set up, how can people, companies, learn more about RTTP so that they can um, start working with HKPC and, and make industry 4.0 a reality and invest further with the help of government resources? Sure, um, visit the HKPC website. So that would be www.hkpc.org. And then um, you will find the contact information and also there are some of the information there. So uh, contact us and then we will arrange the um, consultant to talk to your company to see how we can help you. Fantastic. Um, and that concludes our discussion. Thank you again. This has been a very fun conversation. I'm sure we could do this for hours, but uh, I'm delighted to say that we have some questions from the audience. So um, one of the questions was um, for factories who design, manufacture, and sell medical devices, healthcare, OEM services, and they cannot afford to upgrade to full automation or semi-automation, how can we further compete? How can these uh, factories further compete in the next 10 to 20 years? after they have fully upgraded or? Perhaps what uh, Jonathan, one of the uh, audience members is asking is, uh, yeah, who cannot afford to upgrade to full or semi-automation? Those who cannot. Yeah. Um, uh, that's an interesting point is, um, like <laughs> as I've mentioned, like BASF is a company that is 150 years old. Like we do not have production plants that are 150 years old, right? But like we have a lot of production assets uh, actually in place that are that are reasonably old. Like, and I'm talking decades here, yeah, and I'm talking more than 50 years, yeah. And and it's like, how do you how do you um, you know lift such a production asset that is still you know making the product that it's supposed to do at a quality that is acceptable to the market you know with you know all the kpis fits like you would be stupid if you would shut something like this down right like you know um so eventually you have to think about retrofitting right like and and um you have to be mindful of the economics of that retrofitting so what we are doing is like when we look into um into uh, upgrading our, our plans, for example, with predictive maintenance, right, or augmented reality. Um, we, we are looking into, it's like, what, what can we possibly gain out of this? Is it, is it less downtime? Is it higher throughput, right? Is it better quality? Like, I don't know, is it lower cost, lower energy consumption? There has to be, um, you know, a, a business case behind this, right? This is no, this is no, I would say this is no, no, no magic, 
right? Like you know how to to run, um, you know, return on investment type of calculation. You know whether this makes sense or not. And then eventually you you will figure out like how much can you invest, and you will always find you can invest a little bit. It's like when I think back, like you know, about a plant that we have in in, in China. Um, that is dealing with dangerous, um, like one specific type of chemical that is extremely dangerous uh, to the livelihood of people, but like we need it, like whatever. And, and because of that, we want to understand where are people at any given moment in this plant, because if something happens, like we want to know where people are so we can direct them out of the, the, the immediate zone of danger, right? And like you can do like all types of fancy stuff, like really, 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 really fancy stuff you know, wristbands and, and, and whatnot. No, eventually it's a, it's a simple, uh, you know, it's a Bluetooth device, it's, you know, attached to your, to, your, to your tag, right, that you, that you wear anyhow. There's a couple of receivers, does the job. Doesn't cost a lot of money, works like a charm, right? Like, you know, like you don't always have to go like the full Monty, right? It's like you can do meaningful small things, right? And, and you know, do the math, do the ROI calculation and you will find how much you can spend. So Edmund, then how, how do you think about, you know, to follow up with Jonathan's question, sure. the ability, and you talked a lot about that, and mm -hmm. I really respected that, the, you know, it's not about your internal resources, just because mm -hmm. you say you can't afford it. Well, wait a second, look outside. All you know, right. It's not about your All own right. resources. So can you talk a little bit more about how that sort of context might happen when you mm -hmm. think about factories specifically? Let's talk yep. really focused on factories, yep. perhaps in China. All right. Um, I'm sure you've worked with a lot of okay. factories in China. Okay, so sure. So, you know, um, again, I want to, you know, dispel some of the wrong perceptions people may have when they are thinking about Industry 4.0, they associate with huge investment, whether it is they may even think about, oh, I have to scrap my old manufacturing equipment. You don't need to, as Sebastian mentioned about, there is a lot of some simple retrofitting you may just add a few sensors and then you start to collect data. Um, and then also people may think about, oh, I have to invest a new IT system that will cost me how much money, blah, blah, blah. Nowadays, there's a lot of the subscription-based solutions. So you're only paying a rental fee every month and then you can start even using AI. You can start using machine learning. So that's why it is important to look outside to really understand what's available before you conclude whether your perception is right or wrong. So, and of course, you know, I may not be able to solve your problem just through this uh, webinar, um, but if you don't mind, come to HKPC, we can talk to you more and then show you what I have just mentioned is really feasible um, for your company. Fantastic. Um, going back to one of the questions um, I asked earlier, the need to uh, maybe consider reskilling when you bring in AI and it creates automation. Uh, one of the questions from a gentleman called Danny Ku is the comment about using data will retire the use of skilled labor in manufacturing is an interesting one. Can you comment how would the future workforce change in view of working cohesively in a digitized world? So I believe what he's asking is what specifically will that work look like if someone has had um, in a manufacturing role, their job automated. Oh, wow, what do I do now? <laughs> it's a question to both of you. So maybe I can answer first. Um, yes, you, you know them with the applying of the new technology. So then of course you are no longer operating a machine. You are not even um, may be so-called uh, analyzing the data. But what the future workforce will be doing will be looking at how do we continue to improve the processes by looking at the analytics coming out from the AI or whatsoever, and then see how do I come up with the improved the processes. And so, for example, and also one thing is, you know, now, now they will talk about the predictive maintenance, so which means that the machine will tell you when it is about to break down, and then so then you will, of course, you will replace it. So, but then with all this data, what it helps you to think about is how you may, it may help you to improve your manufacturing processes, 
or improve your product. So I would say the future workforce is more on the innovations or creative side. So you always try to improve something, whether it is the process, it's the manufacturing thing, it's the product, uh, it's the customer experience or whatsoever. Um, and that will be what I'm foreseeing, how the future workforce will be a little bit different from the current workforce. How about yourself, Sebastian? It, again, it depends a little bit on what type of function or you know role that that person is um, in the company. As a, a skilled laborer. A, a skilled a skilled laborer, for example. I'm um, like this whole thing only becomes a problem if you're following sort of like a fixed mindset, right? Like you know, it's like we we, we have to like what there is today is all that we got, right? If you apply more of a growth mindset to it, right? Like you know, if we, um, um, if we, you know, apply these type of technologies, right? And instead of running that plan with ten people, we can do it uh, uh, with seven or six, right? Like, what does that mean for the four, right? Like, eventually, um, you know, um, we we as a company keep on investing in in our in our assets, and we and we keep on you know building new stuff um you know around the globe so like you know eventually these colleagues can be like reskilled and 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 redeployed right um however it will like you know going forward lead um and, and we've touched upon this many times um we we have to be mindful of like taking all of the people along right um, you know, include them in the change process, retrain them, right, in order them to to keep them for the company. How, it, as I've said, how it will look like, you know, the the different, you know, the future will tell. But like, you know, let's keep in mind, like twenty years ago, maybe maybe twenty five years ago. That's that's clearly again, I'm not that old. I just look old. Um, I, you know, it's like people had difficulties using Microsoft Excel. Right and 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 Outlook or like whatever system was was out there at the time. I know I know colleagues who who start like you know in their professional life learned about email. Right. So eventually you 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 grow into this. Right. This is an accelerating and an even you know becoming faster and faster. But this is not an overnight thing. Right. Like you know there is still a time element to it that helps you to gradually move and develop. To, into the future. That's true for, for companies, that's true for, for teams, and that's also true for, for individuals. A nice word, accelerate. I think I like that word. <laughs> yeah, sure you do. <laughs> so we have a, a couple more minutes and a couple more questions. Um, any other resources, just as a quick one, uh, that people should be aware of outside of RTDP when it comes to technology or innovation that you've heard of? Sure. Um, actually. Uh, Hong Kong government has offered more than 40 different types of government subsidies or funding to enterprises in Hong Kong. So some of them is covering uh, like um, on innovations and technology, some is covering on the promotions, developing new market, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, if your company is not familiar with these, then I would strongly recommend that you that um, because in late August, the day will be announced soon. We will be, HKPC will be organizing the fun fair everywhere again. So that will be introducing um, all the different types of uh, funding from the Hong Kong government so that you can have a one-stop shop to learn what's really available for them. And so perhaps some of them will be applicable to your company. Um, so then get to know about it at least you have evaluated, even if you at the end you may conclude that none of them can help you, at least you have done your homework. More knowledge, right? Yes. So that's important. And, and I would strongly suggest you sign up to that. Now, this year, because of the COVID 19 situation, so uh, unlike last year, we do it physically in this building, so we have like hundreds of thousands of people coming anyway. So this year, we'll do it in the webinar format. Um, so then again, that will be a safe way for you to get to know it. And then Later, you can come back to us for an uh, individual counseling session because we have a group called SME Reach Out. Their whole purpose is to reach out to different types of SME uh, to help them. And of course, big corporation register in Hong Kong, we also welcome, we will also help. So. Basically, you should check out the fun fair, the, the 
those who asked. Um, we are nearing the end. So one final question was uh, from an individual called Han, and he's talking about a survey done by Microsoft, and he found that many leaders uh, who surveyed um, Microsoft workers, I'm sorry, Microsoft surveyed a lot of leaders and workers in Hong Kong and found that they were very positive about the future of artificial intelligence in Hong Kong, which is a good thing. Um, about 60% of business leaders and uh, workers believe AI is going to help them. Do you see this going to 100? You know, do you see that slowly, incrementally, that more and more people are going to be optimistic about the future with uh, AI for smart bookmark manufacturing? Um. Does it really have to be 100%? Actually, I don't know. Yeah. Um, some, some, you know, there's some roles in a, in, a, in a company that maybe I'm, you know, not visionary enough, but like, you know, when it comes to selling, right? When it comes to consulting, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, building relationships, it's very difficult to do that with a chatbot. Yeah. Uh, and be it the smartest chatbot in the world, right? Like, you know, at some point there will be, there will be a human element uh, in pretty much everything that we're, that we're going to do. Um, the excitement, the, 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 the 60%, I believe, you know, is, is what it is today, right? Like when, when you think about like, you know, finance, when you think about um, controlling type of tasks, when you think about um, supply chain optimization, inventory optimization, forecasting, you know, that type of stuff. I think, you know, this is, this is, you know, you know, things that you, that you can actually do today. You know, there are technologies out there. There's, you know, this is something that you can do. Uh, gradually, I believe it will not notch up, right? But will it ever reach 100%? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, however, like, you know, I can only say like in our company, AI has, um, you know, an ever growing importance. Uh, we, we no longer do this and do that. No, we, we have actually created an AI strategy um, and, and put dedicated resources onto the topic and starting a lot of initiatives actually around this in order to, to, um, to step up our game here, right? Like, you know, we, we, we do a lot today already. Um, we are, very, very much sure that, that we only, you know, scratch the surface and we need to go deeper and we will go deeper and we will put uh, resources behind that to make this happen. Edmund, what are your thoughts on sort of the business leaders that are approaching you? How do they view AI as a enabler better business? Well, I would say that um, from what we have seen, uh, it is getting more attention at the executive level so they know that it is one of the technology that they have to start to think about or even start to implement to stay competitive. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's no longer a competition about how cheap your labor cost is. It's not even a competition about um, your product, whether it's um, very good or not but it's talking about whether your product has AI functions, whether your manufacturing, if you have to keep on improving, you have to make use of AI. So that's why the trend is already there. So um, the last advice that I would like to give everybody is, if you are still not to understand what it is, then um, start learning about it because uh, it is important uh, for you to be aware of so that you can keep up with the global competition. Fantastic, and that is a great place for us to wrap up. Uh, thank you again, Sebastian. Thank you again, Edmund. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank you. Um, and with that in mind, I'd like to wrap up. Please do feel free uh, to check out the um, HKPC website to learn more. Please feel free to reach out to Accelerate. Uh, please feel free to reach out to myself or to Sebastian on LinkedIn, I'm sure. Um, and we'd love to try and inspire to create a better manufacturing industry and a better Hong Kong. Um, any final words, Edmund or um, HPPC? Sure, so I just want to also do a little bit of the advertising here. Hope people will not just take a bit, but there is also a upcoming free webinar on machine learning in manufacturing. 
on September 7. So pay attention to it. And also there will be a training of machine learning in manufacturing for the beginning level in the late October. So the details will come out in our website soon. And so just stay tuned with this. Fantastic. And um, thank you again, everyone. A copy of this will be recorded and I believe will be put on the website as well. And uh, please stay safe. Uh, please stay positive and uh, continue to, to accelerate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.